And before I minister, Dr. Leo had asked me just to share a little on who I am. Now, my surname is a Spanish surname, but I'm South African. My forefathers come from Spain, but I'm born in South Africa. The place that you saw there is Joburg. My daughter lives there, but I was born in Cape Town, and most of my life I lived in Durban with my dear wife. She won't, she's not here today because my granddaughter is sick and she's looking after my granddaughter. My surname is Dayayende. But it's hard for you to pronounce it, and even hard for me to pronounce it. And it's, it's foolish if you pronounce a Spanish name and you can't speak it, so you'd rather pronounce it in an English way. I can't speak Spanish, so I pronounce it a simple way. D. Alindi. Now, I've taught in Bible schools for close on to 30 years. I've established schools of ministry. I've established churches. But you know what? It's not what you do for God that makes you to be a unique man of God. Amen. The test of a man's soul is not how much he does for God, but how much time he spends alone with God. Amen. Amen. And I say it always, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And as a man of God, I might not know it all, but I know Him that knows it all. Amen. I'm going to start a series on the book of Genesis and more so on the life of Abraham. There's many things that we can learn from the patriarch, Abraham. And I trust this morning that God will open your spirits and open your understanding. And I would say that this series on Abraham probably will be about three to four sermons. So I encourage you next week to bring a pen and paper if I'm ministering next week. Bring a pen and paper. Amen. Amen. Then also support your church. With that in mind, let's turn to Genesis chapter 15. <laughs> And that dear brother that led us in worship, where is he? Oh, brother, I was blessed. Blessed not only by the anointing of God upon you, but your accent. Where are you from? Zimbabwe. <laughs> I thought so. You love me. Praise God. What a lovely accent. Amen. Amen. blessed. Amen. While I'm reading, could some young person get me a glass of water, please? Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Elisa of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed. And no one born in my house is my heir. Right. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own thou shalt be thine heir. And he brought him forth the broad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord. Now notice in your Bible how that the word Lord is spelled there. It's spelled with all capital letters and that means Jehovah. Amen. 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 You must learn to make a distinction in the spelling of the names of God. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, God... Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, 
and laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Note this verse. This is the key verse of the chapter. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant, and that is what we're going to concentrate on for the next couple of weeks, covenant theology. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Genesites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephans, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Let's stand, we're going to pray now, invoke the presence of God as we minister God's word. I'm going to ask the pastors to be to pray. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Please be seated. Regardless of who we are, every one of us is governed and controlled by our five senses. You know quite well that our senses are the eye gate, the ear gate, to smell, to taste, and to touch. All of us communicate with each other, to each other, with these senses. And it's not surprising that when we as individuals, male or female, look for a life partner, a husband or a wife, that we are governed and controlled by our senses. The lady that we would want to spend the rest of our life with as our wife or the husband that the lady wants to spend the rest of her life with has to be appealing to the eyes. Not so. The lady has to be appealing, a wonderful physique, shapely, good looking. The man on the other hand has to be tall, dark and handsome. And we are governed by what we see. And when we look for a life's partner, meaning a husband and a wife, we also look for commonality. We look for things that are common to each of, to each of us. Our hobbies, our likes, and our dislikes. And as we begin the courtship, as we begin to go out and discover each other, there's always this constant problem. And let me say this, when we discuss God's Word, we never ever teach it or preach it in a religious way. You speak it and preach it and teach it, fully explaining the facts of life. And one of the common problems of courtship is always that the lady is always forced 
to prove her love. Always forced to prove her love. Though always waiting to try before you buy. Now, the wise lady will always say, no, you cannot have me before you put a ring on my finger. Amen. And by the way, the engagement ring is but only a deposit. <laughs> the wedding ring is the full installment paid. And a good lady, a Christian lady will always say, you have to wait for the wedding day. We had to enter into a contractual relationship. Now, we've got to understand this. That what I'm doing this afternoon is taking you from what you know of a covenant to that which you do not know of a covenant. It's known as the law of apperception. Now because I've discussed what you know, you eagerly come along with me on the journey to that which you do not know. Now, the marriage ceremony is the sealing of a relationship. It is the spiritual and legal right to, do, to join two people together. Marriage is a legal contract between a man and a woman. And you know that the legal contract is conditioned by certain clauses. You will always find a contract will spell, spell out conditions. And the conditions in the marriage contract is, you know quite well, for richer or poorer, in sickness, in health, till death do us part, and a few others. Now, the vows, are you with me? Yes. The vows that we vocalize are the clauses of the covenant agreement that we will enter into. And to seal this covenant, two very important happenings, exercises, must come into effect. Number one, a legal document must be signed between the man and the woman. Amen? Amen. A legal document must be signed. And then secondly, the marriage must be consummated through the sexual act between a man and a woman. And it's that sexual act that consummates the marriage as such. Now, the ultimate purpose of a marriage is simply this. That two might become one. Two might become one. In the world's economy, one plus one is equivalent to two. In God's economy, one plus one equals one. More than that, in God's economy, one plus one plus one equals one. But the world says three. The Bible says, for this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now here's a spiritual truth that you must grasp this afternoon. A marriage is a contractual legal agreement that is entered by a male and a female by the signing of a legal document and is confirmed, authenticated, verified, ratified through the intimacy of the sexual act which pronounces that the two different sexes are now one personality. Now, listen to this truth, and this is important. Marriage is a lesser picture of what is in heaven. What is in heaven that is so unique in the economy of God? One plus one plus one is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. And what you have between a husband and a wife that enter into current relationship through marriage, it is a lesser picture of the triune God upon the face of the earth. One plus one, two persons becoming one through a covenant relationship. Amen. Now, 
It is difficult for us to comprehend how that God, who is holy and perfect, righteous in all His ways, how that God can enter into a covenant relationship with man. A man like Abraham or Noah or a man like you and I. Amen. When I look at you and you look at me, and we look at our life's partners, our spouses, Amen. you must admit there's great commonality. Amen. And the great commonality between husband and wife is simply this. They both would sin. No one is perfect. Yes. And it's not in any way strange when a man and a woman join together in holy wedlock. Because the great commonality is simply this. Imperfection joins with imperfection. Amen. But when God is concerned, you must understand this. God is perfect. Yes. God is holy. God is undefiled. And how can God who is holy and perfect enter into a common relationship with man that is sinful? Amen. It's impossible. And the Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. How can God enter into covenant with you and I? I've entitled the series the power of attorney. Now, let me just back up now. In marriage, two become one. And the strangeness of it all, there are two distinct personalities. Two different types of people. And you know as well as I know, strange and true, opposites are always attracted to each other. The, the lady would probably be an introvert, very quiet, very reserved. <laughs> and the husband, again, might be very exuberant, very loud. But it's surprising. As the years go on, although they pose apart in expression and in personality, slowly but surely, as they yield to each other, as they give themselves to each other, they become one. I know of certain married couples, more so men and women of God in the ministry, more so Christian people. Do you know that after a time of really working, of becoming one, they begin to look like each other? They now begin to look like brother and sister. They so one in spirit and in body, they read each other's minds. They complete each other's sentences. Amen. Now, this is the purpose of covenant. Amen. This is God's purpose of wanting to have covenant with Abraham, with you and I. That God, you and I, might become one in God. Amen. Just as the husband and the wife begin to look like each other after time of being in covenant with God, we begin to act and behave like our God. Amen. I said to your pastor, to Dr. Leo, any Tom, Dick and Harry can preach God's word. But it takes a Peter, James and a John to present the God of the word. Amen. And that comes because of intimacy of having a relationship with God, shutting yourself off from the world to be alone with God in the closet. Now, I'm laying a premise today. I'm laying a foundation, a basis. These two people are in a contractual relationship. And the best way for you to understand a contractual relationship is for me to explain how in days gone long by, how the contracting parties entered into covenant. And one of the ways was, if I move down, can you, can you see me? All right? So you move and I go down. <laughs> and one of the ways is this. When they entered into their marriage contract, 
In some countries, they act out what is known as the salt covenant. And what it is is this, the two contracting partners each come with a bag of salt. Now, salt in those days was very expensive. Not easy to come by. A very expensive commodity. But this is what they would do as they would act out the covenant relationship. As they would seal it. The two contracting parties would come with their salt bag. And one of them, probably the woman first, would take the salt, no, I would say the man, would take the salt out of his bag, not all of it, some of it, and put it in his wife to be her bag. And then they would close that bag and shake that bag. His salt would be mixed with her salt. Are you with me? Yes. Then she would open her bag again and take salt out of her bag and put it in his bag. He would close it and shake it and mix the salt. Now here's the key. That salt could never ever be retrieved. It's one of the billion chances that he'll get this, his own grain of salt out of that bag. It could never ever be retrieved. And this is what makes marriage one. This is what makes the covenant of two people becoming one. That salt that is placed in the other person's salt bag is a visual aid, a picture of one person stepping into another person's life and saying, all of me is yours. Amen. All of me is yours. I deposit myself into your care. Amen. And the wife in turn does likewise. She deposits herself into her husband. And she loses herself in her husband. And with that mentality, they grow into oneness. Now, let me say this. The same applies to us and to God when we enter into covenant with God. And Jesus prayed, Father, as you and I are one, let them be one. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The strength of the church is unity. The strength of the church is not its number. There are bigger churches that outnumber us ten times. But you know you can be a smaller church numerically, but what will make you stronger than a bigger church in number is simply that you have oneness. There's a unity of spirit. is very, very important. I want to go further. And I really want to illustrate the importance of a covenant. Remember, I'm taking you from what you should know or know a little of that will help you with that which I teach you later on or preach to you that you don't know. Let's go to uh, Samuel chapter 18. Are you enjoying this? Yes. Samuel chapter 18. I never marked my Bible, so I'll leave it so. Verses 1 to 4. And it came to pass, you got it? Samuel 1 18, 1 to 4. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Amen. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Notice this, verse 3. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan and David entered into a covenant relationship. Now, listen carefully. The name Jonathan means a gift of God. Jonathan was the prince 
He was next in line to be king. A type of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We know that God's hand was upon David. But it was in order that Jonathan succeed his father Saul. But notice what this man does because of a covenant relationship. Our Bible teaches us clearly, esteem each other better than you esteem yourself. Amen. In other words, always think better of the next person than what you think of yourself. Never elevate yourself above others. And then now I thank God and I sense the spirit that Dr. Leo has the self same spirit. God has placed us on a level. But we all, we, we've come to acknowledge the reason why God has placed us on a high level in the world. Simply to pick you up to our level. Amen. Not to look down upon you. It's not what you know. It's who you know. And if you know Jesus, your place is here alongside of me and alongside of Dr. Leo. Equals in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, notice what Jonathan had done. A covenant is made between a royal person and a commoner. You know what a commoner means? Someone that just walks the street. A simple nobody. A simple miss nobody. But Jonathan enters into a covenant relationship with a shepherd boy. And notice what he does. First and foremost, he strips himself of his royal robe and he gives it to David. He gives it to the common of David. Amen? Amen. In other words, he's giving David his royalty. He's clothing David with his person, with his position, with his office. You know what I'm saying? And this is so important. Please look at me. When a man takes a woman and you're going to apply to our covenant relationship with God and I will teach you further on. When a man takes a woman for his wife something unique takes place. Amen. Not only do they become one but the woman, listen to me carefully, is more than willing to fall Go her former glory. She puts aside her name. Because her name is associated with the glory of her father. But now she's married to a man with whom she is to become one. And what she does, she foregoes her glory. And when she takes the man and they enter into a covenant agreement through marriage, she takes the glory of her husband. She takes his honor, his dignity. And if you heard the same, what's in her name? Amen. But I want you to know there's glory and honor in your surname. Amen. And when a man gives a woman his name, he's giving her his glory, his grandeur, his splendor, and his majesty. Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. Now, it doesn't mean that she has no glory of her own. He simply adds to her glory. Amen. He simply adds to her honor. He simply adds to her prestige. And this is what covenant means. It's God entering into covenant with us. Amen. And God enriching our life. Amen. Giving honor and dignity and prestige to us who are no one. Oh, someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jonathan does something more. Amen. He takes his sword. He takes his sword and he gives it to David. Yes. Amen. The sword is always the emblem of kingly authority. Amen. Amen. Remember the story of Esther? She couldn't approach the king unless he stretched forth what? The scepter, the sword. Hmm? Amen. And when Jonathan gave his sword to David, he was handing over his authority. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when a man takes a wife, he gives his wife his authority. When I'm not here and you speak, you will speak as if I'm here because I've given my person to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the same applies when we enter into covenant with God. He gives us his authority. He does something else. The Bible says he gave David his bow and his garments. The bow. What does the bow speak of? What does the bow speak of? Let me say this. You shoot a bow down with an arrow. You put the arrow in the bow and you shoot from the bow. You're aiming at something. Are you with me? Yes. You're aiming at something. Amen. And when a man takes a wife, he gives her not only his honor and his glory, his name, but he gives her his garments and he gives the lady his bow. He has a vision for that marriage. He has a plan and a purpose for that marriage. They're just not going to meander along life journey. They're going to accomplish things. Amen. And when God enters into a common relationship with man, He gives us His body. Amen. His vision. Amen. 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 No true man of God has his own vision. There's too many men with guru mentality that are bragging about their vision. I've got no vision on my own. I'm a servant. Amen. I'm a servant. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I haven't got a mind of my own. I listen to the dictates and the commands of my God. Amen. That's why the woman received the role to have some a submissive spirit. Do you know that a woman is a born leader? Do you know that? That's why she's told by God to be subservient because she always wants to have the last word. <coughs> Not because she's uh, 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 being disrespectful. That's her natural tendency to lead. <coughs> Amen. But that, that, that vision, that drive, that energy, the man must control it with his vision. Amen. Now, we go on. She forgoes her honor and glory to an extent, but the husband adds to her glory. I want to turn your attention just to one more time. Because we lay a premise. Are you with me? Amen. We lay a premise concerning the Abrahamic covenant. Amen. Time doesn't permit us to go to the scripture. But Matthew 26, 26 says this. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Tell it, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it. All of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Amen. Now notice the covenant. And this is the essence of all covenants. This is the essence of the truth. The whole covenant of Jesus is the giving of self. Amen. 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 It's the giving of Himself. We know that He is the bread of life. And we cannot have life unless we feast upon the bread of life. He took the wine. Amen. Amen. And said, drink of it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Amen. This is my blood that's going to be shed for you. But He never stopped there. Amen. And herein lies the weakness of marriage. Herein lies the weakness of the church because we fully 
fail to understand the full meaning of jail and covenant relationships. Amen. And it's seen at the communion table. Amen. It's seen at the communion table. Jesus said, do this. Amen. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. And what do we do? We put on a special suit, a special dress, and it's communion Sunday. And what we do? We break the bread. Amen. It's important. But it means more than eating bread and drinking the wine. You know what Jesus is saying? The way I give my life for fallen humanity, the way I'm willing to go to the cross and die for fallen humanity, you do this in remembrance of me. In other words, your covenant relationship with your wife, with your brother, the church, and with God must be likened unto the covenant relationship that Jesus had with us. You must give your life. That's covenant. I'm not in this relationship for what I can get out of it. I'm in this relationship for what I can give to it. Amen. Amen. This is my body. The Bible says this, I am my brother's keeper. Amen. Amen. And when we break bread together, it is a sign of covenant relationship. And I trust as we further go on with the Abrahamic covenant, you're going to get insights to your relationship with God, insights to the relationship to your husband and to your wife, and insights to your relationship to the church Amen. and the community. Hallelujah. You know, we break bread. I haven't seen any church break bread the way we break bread. Totally different. Yes. <laughs> Always taught my churches. Distribute the emblems, the bread and the wine, and wait. And I will read the relevant scriptures, and then I will take the bread and break it. And I will tell the people to do exactly the same. Break the bread. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Now you go to each other and say what Jesus says. Just as that bread was the emblem of my sacrifice upon the cross, dying for humanity, so do you take the bread and say, Sister and brother, I'm willing to die for you. You are my brother. You are my sister. I'm your keeper. Amen. What do you think of these church? Amen. What do you think church is about? Church is about a covenant relationship. The Bible says that Jesus yes. is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. Amen. We should feel each other's pain. Amen. Others' sorrow. We should feel for each other. Hallelujah. The Bible says we should care one for the other. Amen. Carry each other's burdens. Amen. Is it possible? Is it possible that God can enter into covenant with you and I? Amen. These principles that are laid in the foundation of our teaching concerning the Abrahamic covenant, can it become a living reality in your life and not my life? Amen. 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 Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Just raise your hands to the Lord. For your praise, your glory, and your honor. As you stand there before the presence of God this day. How is your covenant relationship with your spouse? How is your covenant relationship with your husband and with your wife? My brother and my sister, Jesus, we should become one. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
We should be one. When the people see your husband, they must be seeing your personality. You, your husband act and behaves like you do. Upright. Has a relationship with your church. Has a relationship with God. How is your common relationship? Have you deposited yourself into the church, into your spouse? Have you lost yourself? And are you living for the betterment of others? That's common. I'm not in this relationship for what I can get out of it. I'm in it for what I can give unto it. How I can enrich it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you been blessed? Have you been challenged? Yes. 